Am I filming again on the Friday before this video goes up? Yes, but I have a good excuse this time. It's because this is the first day in two weeks that my dog has been at daycare and I had to clean so much piss out of my couch. <laughs> She's never been a dog that pees on furniture. The entire time I've had her, she has not done that, but she gets spayed and she's like, everywhere is my territory. She pooped in my living room again today. She did it while I was sleeping. So I didn't get to it in time when the automatic scheduler for my Roomba went off again. This is the third time I've had to scrape dog shit out of my Roomba. I've just been washing my cushion covers on my couch and sleeping, enjoying joyous rest uninterrupted by a dog that will bark her head off if she sees people deign to use the sidewalk. I love her so much and I'm so excited to see her tonight, but I'm even more excited to bring her back on Monday. <laughs> Hello, by the way, it's tired pet mom Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up home scale of biscuit? Happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, it's when I do something on my channel called Bad Movies in a Beat. The series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on and I'm actually gonna do it this week. As a side note, uh, last week I was depressed and I was kind of depressed the week before that too. Um, for those of you that were so sweet to give me words of encouragement, I really appreciate that. And I'm feeling a lot better the last few days, knock on wood, because that particular one was a shape shifter. I would feel better than I wouldn't. I would feel better than I wouldn't. It was just a lot, but we're here today. I think I'm really excited too, because we got a doozy this week, baby. But before we get started with the festivities, I gotta send it over to Adroll Kenny so she can secure us a bag. Cause depression don't stop rent. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is Avril Kenny, and today's video is sponsored by HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit delivery service that offers you fresh, delicious, and healthy meals delivered straight to the comfort of your own home. You know the deal, baby. Pre-portioned, pre-shopped for, pre-planned. I don't think about nothing and I love it. Nothing but static in here and a full belly. HelloFresh is a great way to get out of recipe ruts, great way to try out new flavors, and most recipes can be done in under 30 minutes. Some can be done even quicker than that, like 15. It's a great way to save you time. It's a great way to save you money. They have different meals to fit your dietary restrictions. If you are vegetarian, pescatarian, you're looking after your carbs, looking after your protein. They have vegan meals. I think I actually tried my first vegan meal from them recently. That was the tofu coconut, Kirkner tofu coconut curry and it was very very good I've also had that same meal but not vegan I think I had it with chicken in it and it was also bomb so so if you would like to try out HelloFresh go to HelloFresh.com and use code Kenny 16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping big thanks again to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video now let's get on to the debauchery y'all remember when the only makeup that people wore was mac am i showing my age i remember like early beauty guru days i had to know what every eyeshadow was by name and it was assumed it was mac because there was no other makeup company wow what a time to be alive <laughs> i'm gonna go in with carbon black last time we were here we talked about glitter a masterpiece <laughs> Surely. It was Mariah Carey, the movie from like 2001 that was known just for being awful. It is really bad. I did see in the comments though, a lot of people were like, it was my like childhood movie. I didn't even know it was supposed to be bad. And I'm like, that's fair. That's how I felt about uh, Catwoman. One of the many like stars born type films, uh, but it's just really, really bad. <laughs> it's just really badly made and really poorly thought out, and it was great. <laughs> I love the soundtrack, been listening to it on and off for the last week. And my video is what you'd expect. I don't know if that's good or bad. You can look at it. <laughs> It'll be linked up above, or you can check it out in the Bad Movies in a Beat playlist. And today, oof. <laughs> We, we're in for a treat, baby. We're in, we're in for something golden. We are looking at a movie. I have been waiting on pens and needles to watch for months because it looked bad in a way that looked so fulfilling to my garbage loving heart. Today, we're looking at the latest piece of work to come out from our friends Voltage Pictures, the makers of such glorious film as the After series, <laughs> and therefore is no stranger to this channel. And another thing that we're no stranger to is watching movies that are Harry Styles fan fiction turn novels turn movies. And this is shockingly another one. 
And it's also another movie with Dylan Sprouse in it. If you recall, Dylan Sprouse was in the second after movie and he just suddenly disappeared from the series after that. And at first I thought it was because he wanted better for himself, but instead I think it's because he wanted to be a lead in this piece of shit. He deserved the lead in a terribly made Harry Styles fan fiction turned movie. He will not be outdone. He's reaching for the stars. I am mad at him. Uh, today we're looking at Beautiful Disaster aptly named. I remember seeing the trailer for this on Twitter because that's where all the worst things go and that's where I'm quickly notified of garbage. The trailer looked like this beautiful whooshing fever dream of YA trope after YA trope. That combined with this beautiful synopsis, how could one say no? Travis Maddox. I know it's easy to get it mixed up because of Trevor, but his name is Travis and I want to call him Trevor so bad, spends his nights fighting in underground boxing matches and his days as the ultimate college campus charmer. Intrigued by a freshman's resistance to his appeal, Travis offers her a simple bet. If he loses his next fight, he must remain sex free for a month. If he wins, she must live in his apartment for the same amount of time. And again, I went in there wanting trash and I must admit that this movie did not leave me wanting. It's a mess. I kind of love it. <laughs> I think the thing that I find most fascinating about this movie, and I've kind of talked about the after movies that I unironically love because they're so batshit. Any of the movies that for once stops taking itself so f***ing seriously, like this is garbage. Just know that and behave as if you know that and we'll all have a much better time. The thing about this movie is that it's very aware of what type of film it is. It's garbage and it knows it and it's unashamed that it's a campy piece of shit. Like the after movies, again, some of them do, some of them don't. That one's a series, so I'm comparing them to each other and it's like, there's a tonal inconsistency throughout them. But this movie, as far as I'm aware, is a one-shotter. So it's just from the jump, bat shit. It doesn't take itself too seriously. It's not presenting itself as anything other than trite, almost satirical garbage. And I love it. <laughs> I do. It's a rom-com that's actually Kind of funny, it got a few chuckles out of me, much to my surprise, he gad. I don't know what color foundation I am anymore, cause the sun is out, but I don't go outdoors. I just hope this is some indication that going forward, Voltage Pictures will just accept that they make trash and stop trying to be something that they're not. I think if they going forth would just like admit to themselves like, hey, we make garbage and they did so accordingly. They made movies that were that self-aware. Unironically, it will be some of my favorite films to come out in recent memory. I wholeheartedly believe that. So I hope this is to indicate that that's where they're leaning now. They're just gonna accept that they don't need to be serious. That doesn't need to be their place. There's plenty of people making great um, real movies. We make garbage and that's okay. There's so many signs to indicate that this movie is aware of itself and I love that. There's so many callbacks to after and like other dumb movies. Somebody's wearing a Trevor shirt. One of the guys ends up watching one of the after movies and he's like, Tessa deserves better, man. And I don't know, I think this movie just reads, we're having fun and it's garbage and we know that. Let's just have our fun. And I kind of appreciate that. Yes, this movie is golden. I shan't besmirch it. So without further ado, this is Beautiful Disaster 2023. The movie begins with our main female protagonist, Abby, who is on a bus going to Sacramento from Vegas, leaving her father an email, letting him know that she is leaving. Now you can tell from the email that they have a bit of a tumultuous relationship. This is YA after all, so of course, which of course we'll learn more about as the story goes on but essentially she's like I can't keep bailing you out anymore and there's some hinting that she's been playing poker for him and winning money on his behalf ever since she was a very little girl she's going off to college in Sacramento looking for a new start it's time to live out her own life instead of spending all of it just bailing out her dad she doesn't tell him where she's going. She's just like, I'm, I'm off. I need to live my own life. Goodbye. When she arrives at college, she sees her friend, America. They are also roommates. They were roommates. You, yeah. <laughs> you knew we weren't gonna escape that. <laughs> but like, come on. Now, if you're familiar with the channel, you've, you've, you know what YA is. You know our tropes, right? What type of person do you think that Abby is going to be? 
right? Priggish, smart, hardworking, diligent student, very responsible, the serious type, the type that needs, you know, to discover that the way to actualization is through a bad boy's dick. And that's what we're gonna get. So being that she is like that, may we guess what her opposite, her love interest will be. He's an underground MMA fighting bad boy played by Dylan Sprouse, I'm sorry. Played by Dylan Sprouse, an exceedingly inflated ego and a propensity to use overly familiar pet names. So get ready. Now her roommate America has a boyfriend. I don't remember what his name is. It doesn't matter. They do have some moments of comedy that I probably won't bring up. Some of it is actually kind of funny but it doesn't matter to the grand scheme of the story. So I'm gonna probably skip it when we're talking about the retailing. But um, she has a boyfriend who invites them to something called The Circle, which is a secret underground fighting ring. I don't know why you thought Abby of all people would wanna go to the secret underground fighting ring, but okay, go off. This is where she has her first glimpse of America's boyfriend's cousin, Travis Mad Dog. Maddox as he's known in the underground fighting circle because apparently he's very, very good. And you know how it goes. They see each other. There's this inexplicable attraction. Are you new here? Yeah, I- ah! But Travis is able to take home the win, leaving a mark on Abby, literally his opponent's blood. <laughs> all over her stereotypical good girl sweater. But that isn't the only parting gift he leaves her with. He also goes up to her, insinuates that her being there is trouble for him because he's not usually so distracted. He calls her Pigeon because that's the nickname we chose for this movie. But after meeting Travis, Abby is certainly hot and bothered. She goes to the shower, thinks about him there as she uh, diddles with herself. But to be honest, Travis is the least important thing on her mind right now because she also has to pay tuition which apparently she hasn't done yet. I didn't even know it's been a while. <laughs> I don't remember the logistics of what you have to pay before you can get on campus, but she goes to the office, the financial office, and tries to pay in cash, something that is alarming to the person there. My mom's out of the picture. My dad isn't a good guy and I, I just have to do it this way. So can you like let it slide? And they say they'll let it slide this one time, but going forth, she's gonna have to like figure out a bank account situation. But these are some like initial hints that Abby also has a bit of a dark side or a dark past that she needs to come to terms with in regards to her family. So at least in one way, this is breaking the trope. Usually it's the guy who has this whole like horrible relationship with his family and she has to heal him through pussy. So we like a little switch up. Hi. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> but this is used largely as just like expository dialogue to explain that again, she's the one with the dark past and ultimately explain her initial aversions to Travis. Because like any good old YA situation, we're gonna have to have one of many tropes. This one does a good old enemies to lovers. I love it, enemies to lovers. Enemies to lovers, friends to lovers, friends to enemies to lovers. Nice, we love it. One thing I regret most about this particular set of piercings is that I forgot that hair could get caught in it. I've been suffering ever since, but I love it so much, it's so pretty. It's so pretty. Because she ends up seeing Travis on campus and was seemingly incredibly surprised that, quote, a guy like him even goes to college. But they start off, they banter, he hits her with sexual double entendre. Sorry, have we met? Oh, you, you don't remember Travis? You, you ruined her sweater. I ruined a lot of sweaters. She says he's not her type. He says he's everybody's type. I aspire to have like a fourth of the undue confidence of a man. I, I would be <laughs> unstoppable. He later finds her looking at photos of him on his Instagram, sorry, photogram. <laughs> Didn't get that clearance. When she believes she's alone, she does admit to herself that she finds him very, very sexy. And after some banter, he's like, I'll take you out. There's some back and forth. Again, the undue confidence of a man. You're not going to let this go, are you? 
I'll pick you up at eight. This is very wet and I love the color, but there's too much product on my mouth. Let's reapply that, but just less of it. And now it looks like a different color because I have foundation on my mouth. Okay, weird. But as a show of protest, she comes dressed in sweatpants. She doesn't let him pay for food, says outright that this is not a date. And ultimately a big part of her protest outside of her own backstory and how she doesn't have space for more drama from a guy like him because he seems like nothing but drama. I don't want to be one of the undoubtedly many, many notches on your bedpost. But they do seem to have some rapport, some banter, some chemistry. So they decide to stay purely platonic friends. Enemies to friends to lovers. A little switch up. And I was like, yeah, sure, that's gonna last. While walking and talking, he brings up kind of in passing that his family home isn't far away at all. She makes a little snide joke about how is it because he was afraid to be away from his mommy, little mommy's boy, you little bitch. And he's like, nah, uh, cause my mom's dead. <laughs> As a fellow member of the Dead Mom Club, I can laugh at that. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I found it funny. <laughs> so she apologizes profusely. And he's like, well, my dad's still around. He raised all five of us, all five boys, and they all have like a pretty good relationship. But she notably refuses to really go into any depth about her family because Undoubtedly, it's a miss. The next day while jogging, she um, picks up a Frisbee that was thrown her way, and while throwing it back, accidentally smacks the f out of a passerby's balls. I don't know what they used for that sound effect, <laughs> but something about the sheer weightiness of how his balls got rocked sent me into a tizzy. Oh, oh no! He's fine. I am four years old, okay? I wasn't expecting it, and also the heaviness of that sound effect was crazy. He ends up introducing himself as he arrives in pain. This is Parker. He'll return later. That night, the water goes out at the dorm, and so Abby decides to ask America, hey, can we just stay at your boyfriend's place overnight because there's no running water at our dorm? They say, yeah, and as long as she doesn't go into Travis's room, she'll be fine. Lo and behold, he lives there. Small world, if this weren't a movie. They're like, don't even worry about Travis. He's never here. He's always out. Lo and behold, not only does she see him, she sees him in a French girl. And this of course is Travis talking more about how he's, you know, a love him and leave him type of guy. The French girl leaves her number. He throws it away. He's like, that's, no, that's her stake in her claim. Nah, 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 nah. We just hear consenting adults that do the boom, boom, and then she goes on her way. Uh, apparently they met up on something called Consent Date, a fictional app that allows you to send the kinks you consent to before meeting, which is hopefully a very dark joke and not some idea of a more dystopian future. I'm all for like being upfront about kinks because the last thing I want to do is get there and you trying to pee on me. But the idea of trying to make an app like this as like a contract before going just sounds like, a, again, a very dark joke and a lot of sexual assault. Of all their kind of satirical retorts, this is the one that didn't hit out the park. He offers his bed to sleep in if she'd like, which is a luxury that he doesn't give any woman who's ever been in the home. And the reason we're supposed to accept that she's a difference than any of these other women is simply because this is a YA movie. So, and how else are we gonna get the story going if they don't get, you know, artificially closer? Not like they have a couch or anything. <laughs> we don't plan to have sex. So that's fine, you can sleep in my bed. So she does. The next morning, he's on full tent. Um, and they were very generous. <laughs> Maybe it's him. I, I mean, in fairness, I've never like asked myself if Dylan Sprouse has a giant dick. But, <laughs> but while asleep, Abby, uh, Joy sticks him thinking that it's a cat. What part of, oh, I guess the tail. <laughs> I was about to say, what part of a cat did you think this was? Um, and he wakes up like, uh, not quite what you think it is, bruh. They have a good old rom-com misunderstanding. They're yelling at each other, but she's like, wait, I can't do this because I'm late for my bio exam. After her exam, uh, she fell in the mud on the way there, by the way. She runs into Parker again, the guy that she hit in the balls. And she asks about his balls. Like, are your balls okay? And while they're having this conversation, I'm like, how old is this man supposed to be? Is he supposed to be an undergrad? He's just a dude. But he's 40 
and he's playing 23. We're bringing that back from my um, Dear Evan Hansen's video because the brooding hot 25 year old teenager song didn't fit. But yeah, use sunscreen people, non-negotiable. Anyway, they flirt about his broken balls <laughs> and eventually he asks her to dinner. Dr. Hayes. He's jumping a gun, you know? I just started that school. Oh, he's a resident. Hmm. He still don't look, what, how old is he supposed to be then, 25? What's a 25 year old asking a freshman out for? That's weird. <laughs> but okay, I guess I'm not supposed to think about it too much anyway. But on the way out of dinner, he uh, gets a message about a show that's happening that night and they spontaneously end up going together. Now, Abby, was thinking that it was like Shakespeare or something, like a something that was playing in the area, but apparently it's not, or they accidentally went to the wrong show. I don't know. But what they ended up in <laughs> is a MMA match. Meanwhile, Travis is talking to his cousin about how Abby hasn't texted him back after he sent her apology text this morning about the weird dick thing. <laughs> he's having trouble getting her out of his mind because he's truly and utterly enamored by her. Abby's date apparently is a big fan of Travis, which must be awkward. And she's like, I can't do this. I need to get some air. So she goes out into the lobby where she sees Travis. This is where they heatedly start their bet, which is if his opponent manages to hit him once, he will forego sex for a month. And if he wins without the man ever touching him, she has to stay with him for the same amount of time. We read the synopsis. So the fight begins and goes the way you think it would. Admittedly, the celebration wasn't what I was expecting, but. I laughed. I shouldn't have laughed, but I did. Rightfully so, on the way home, her date is completely perplexed by the progression of the night. He's like, so I went on a date with you and now you're moving in with Travis Maddox? But she assures him that she has no interest in him, so much so that she like insinuates that she would like a good night kiss from him, something that Travis immediately interrupts. Ah! Oh, Jesus. Yeah, wonder, yeah. <laughs> but Abby is still very much so in the enemy stage. She's like, there's a wall between us. Again, I don't see why you can't sleep on the couch, but okay, cool. But of course, over the 30 days, they slowly become more and more friendly with each other, more comfortable with each other, become friends in a way with a lot of sexual attention. They spend time together outside of the apartment willingly, even to such an extent that she goes to their family dinner with all the Maddox boys. Um, I haven't brought this up, but there's quite a lot of product placement in this movie, which I find very funny. I think Chime probably sponsored something because they just looked a little too close to a credit card at one point. Maybe a KFC sponsor because they bring up KFC at this dinner because that's what they have at dinner. That looks disgusting. Who has ever purchased corn from KFC? Is that real? In fairness, I don't eat KFC. I'm a Popeye's bitch personally, but especially because they changed out the two things I liked on the menu. Who the f said to get rid of the wedges. Change the barbecue sauce on the hot wings. You need to fire whoever the f that is, dumbass. They also play poker. Again, something that Abby, if you don't remember, has trauma around and she isn't interested in playing at first, but she ends up getting egged into playing, you know, after some good old, family sexism. And eventually she takes them on and takes all of their money. They then put together that Abby must actually be the daughter of a famous poker player that had lost a lot of rounds recently and had started having his daughter play on his behalf. That daughter's nickname was Lucky 13. And they ended up putting together that Abby was indeed Lucky 13. And they kind of fangirl about it. They're like, oh my God. But by the time we get to day 30, the tension or whatever you want to call it is reaching a fever pitch and they end up finally making out in his bed after she bites his titty. Yeah, that's how it usually starts from what I hear. I wouldn't know. I haven't had sex in so long. I, I am actually a virgin again. My shit about to close up like a wound. <laughs> but yeah. Good for them, I guess. Anyway, she ends up throwing him off of her though when things start to get a little too hot for her. And he's like, I'm confused. And then they go back and forth and he's like, I'm sure you don't wanna hear about how I feel about you. And she's like, yeah, because I don't feel the same way. And he's like, you're a liar. And they go back and forth and they make out again. Lucky. <laughs> Some of us have undergone a year of healing and thus are not even attracted to the people that she would have slept with in the past. So instead, my shit is drying up like a raisin in the sun. So congrats to you, Abby.
Lucky bitch. <laughs> anyway, she runs away again. She's like, oh, I can't do this. Huh? She ends up meeting up with America in the bathroom and she's like, oh my God, I think I'm in love with him. Wow. Meanwhile, Travis is super nervous in the bedroom waiting for her to come back. Um, he's like posing and shit is really funny. But while he's there, she gets a text from a guy named Mick on her computer and it's like, I miss you and I love you and stuff like that. <laughs> if you didn't see this coming, it's a misunderstanding. Mick is her father <laughs> who's been trying to contact her since she left Las Vegas, but he doesn't know that. So he leaves in a huff. He eventually comes back, uh, this time smelling of alcohol and holding a cat that isn't his. Abby finally sees him and she's worried. She's like, where have you been? And he was like, what are you worried about me for? Shouldn't you be with your boyfriend, Mick? You idiot, Mick is my dad. That, that would explain, yeah. So now they have to start another bout of fighting. She's like, you invade my privacy, you go through my messages and then you ghost me and come back drunken with a cat. I see who you really are and I'm just not gonna do that. She ends up reconnecting with Parker and they stay up late eating in the library and he talks about why he wants to be a pediatrician. And at some point he ends up getting a text and we find out that the text was somebody who knew that Travis was currently doing a surprise birthday party for Abby that night. And they figured that she would be with Parker, which they were correct. And he takes her to the party. Abby sees Travis, things are a bit awkward. Nothing a bit of alcohol can't fix. She tries to make Travis jealous by doing what she understands is twerking <laughs> on Parker. And he's like, all right, I can tell you wanna be with him. Like, you don't have to do this. I really wish you would just uh, just go there. <laughs> like, you seem to wanna do that, so go. Travis is like, you've been drinking way too much. You need to stop, you need to slow down. You've consumed nothing but soup and shots all day. And then they argue about how they aren't good for each other and how, after the bet is over, they will never see each other again. They drunkenly argue outside and eventually make out until she throws up in his face. I'm so sorry. I also did not know that was coming. <coughs> she continues vomiting back at the house and they have a, a theoretically cute moment if she hadn't literally thrown up in his open mouth. But he's like, the best part of you being this drunk is that you won't remember me telling you right now that I am madly in love with you. Girl, <laughs> you threw up in his mouth and he still says I am madly, he must be. <laughs> She's like, aw, let's get pancakes from the International House of Pancakes. We gotta get that sponsor in. Apparently that was in their talking points. You gotta say the whole name, not IHOP. Also while drunk, she calls her father and says that she really misses talking with him and tells him that she's in Sacramento in college. And he's like, I really miss talking to you. Things kind of, stop there for the time being. But the next morning, being that it is her birthday and officially the last day of them together as roommates, she says, let's celebrate by giving me a foot massage. We should do that. This leads to massaging other places. He give her a hit, in case I wasn't clear. Um, and then they have sex. Is it in? Is it in? That's funny, that's funny. Apparently they have sex all day, that's all they do. We don't see them do anything other than have sex and then it's nighttime. But the next morning she's off without a word and off to class where she is approached by a strange man next to a vehicle who's saying that she has to get in. And like any other woman who's ever seen the news, she says, no. And he's like, it's about your dad. Your dad owes my boss a lot of money. Um, and they're gonna break his legs if you don't come with me. In the car she goes, driving back towards Vegas. Meanwhile, Travis is losing his shit because he just had sex with a woman that he loves and now she just disappeared without a word and without a trace. America is able to pin her location as going towards Las Vegas. So off Travis goes to find her in Las Vegas. Abby ends up seeing her dad and finds out that he apparently owes the guy that he always owes money about $100,000. And he's like, well, I'ma need you, Abby, to start playing poker again to pay off this debt. I need it by midnight. She's like, I am underage. If I get caught, then I have to drop out of college 
That is not cool. This is not good. Which had me sitting there thinking like, how was she playing before? Wasn't she like 12 years old? <laughs> like she was underage before. Is there not an age limit for competitions, but there's age limits for a casino, I guess. But eventually she agrees. She goes down to the casino, finds some idiots that underestimate her and takes all their money. Only to get caught by the security guard who apparently is the guy that she went to high school with or something. And he's like, yeah, I know you're underage. You gotta give me the money, dude. You gotta give me the chips. So then she's like, dad, I'm sorry. I got caught. I, I, I let you down. I'm so sorry. Figure out how to get away and get a burner phone and blah, 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 blah. Which I'm like, if it's that easy to get away, then what, what the, the, why are we doing all this for? That's my biggest gripe with this movie, I will say. The bad guy, quote unquote, we have no urgency really to avoid him or to think of him as like a truly bad guy because too many people are cool with just like sitting down chatting with him. So when she goes back to the boss, she's like, I lost the money, a guy from high school whose name I know has the money, he has your money. Um, and he's like, what we could do is have you get out of retirement in California where the betting age is lower and we can split the profits 50 50 essentially trying to force her out of retirement before she can answer guess who busts through the door once away they again start arguing i don't even know what she mad for <laughs> and they yell at each other again this one is looking very after this might even be the same hallway um, they just did different lighting he's like i love you and she's like you make me crazy and then they comedically f in a hotel room destroying the entire like the sink everything off the walls i I will say all the comedic scenes this is the one that was a bit over a bit ham-fisted a little overkill and it went on for way too long at some point at some point we need to know when to pull it for the correct like amount of funny if we would have made it half the length it would have been hilarious but while she's sleeping travis listens to a threatening message from the boss that was sent to her and he's like i have an idea i can do a fight against this huge prize fighter in the area and I can get you your money, leave her alone. So he leaves to do that. When she wakes up, she gets the message from Travis that that's what he's doing and that she should go to the parking garage to get a car to drive out. But while she's there, guess who she overhears? The security guard and her dad. They are in cahoots. And this is all a plan to get her out of retirement. He never owed the boss any money. They just trying to trick her into being a poker player again. So she goes up to the security guard, tases him. And she goes up to her dad and tases him too. Not enough to knock him out. So you weren't in debt? You had me come all the way out here and you not even in debt? Ain't nothing wrong with you? He's like, you know, I'm just, I just need money for my lifestyle. And she's like, get the f out of the car. And then she steals their car and drives over to uh, Maddox's fight, trying to let him know that he doesn't have to do the fight. He wasn't in debt to anybody. He's just a piece of shit like he's always been. Luckily, Abby is able to get there in time and hit the dude with a chair to distract him enough, just in time too, because right then a freak accident lights the entire building on fire. So, which was random as but okay. But all is well in a way. Uh, she admits she loves him. They find the money she won in the back seat. They decide to stay in Vegas for the night. And according to the credits, they elope in Vegas. And that's the movie. It's incredibly stupid. Being that it is a comedy, there's only so much I can say about how funny something actually is without you just watching the movie. But I thought it was funny. I thought it was dumb. And I like that. Again, it's very like in a way satirical to all the other movies that happen in this genre. It has all the tropes that you would expect, but it just doesn't take itself nearly as seriously as any of those movies do. And for that, I give it like a seven. It's not great film, it's trash, but I love trash. So watch the movie if you're curious about it. I think you, I think if you like garbage the way I do, you might uh, enjoy this one because that is what it is, trash. Um, I Again, I hope this means that more of Voltage Pictures will end up being this type of trash, this self-aware trash instead of this like 
full of itself, self-aggrandizing piece of shit that it is while still being a piece of shit. And I hope this is a sign that things are looking up. Anyway, that's all for today, folks. If you liked today's video, feel free to like today's video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter, both of which are KennyJD. Um, if you have any bad movies that you think I should watch, feel free to let me know in the comment section or over on Twitter. That's also a place that I'm at a lot. Also, feel free to check out my Wish Trend set um, if you ever wanted to know what I use for my skincare because you can get it for 45% off. And I will see you guys next time.